go ahead and get started, or maybe some more folks wandering in after lunch time. But we're trying to get back on the fast schedule wise. So <laughs> let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to session 3E. We could be the way forward using primary sources to examine the creation of a sustainable university. Um, so we have two presenters who are going to be doing this presentation at the end of the presentation, and hopefully there will be time for questions as well. As a reminder, all annual meeting attendees are expected to observe the SGA code of conduct, which you can find on page three of your program. And also, just so that you're aware, the session is being recorded. So, our presenters this afternoon are Bailey May Rogers, who is the archives coordinator at Florida Gulf Coast University, and Victoria Jones, university archivist at Florida Gulf Coast University. So, thank you to our presenters for joining here all the way from Florida. And I'll pass over to you. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our session today. Um, so, as uh, Becky just said, um, our presentation is We Could Be the Way Forward Using Primary Sources to Examine the Creation of a Sustainable University. Uh, as you said, I'm Victoria Jones. I'm the University Archivist at our Gulf Coast University. Uh, and we're really excited to be here today. We are to talk about our project. And I'm Bailey Rogers, Bailey May Rogers. I'm the archives coordinator. So Vic and I work really closely at uh, the archives. So before we begin discussing sort of the details of our project, we thought it would be important to give you a bit of context uh, about to how we got to this project in general. As we said, we're from Florida Gulf Coast University, or FGCU. We're located in Fort Myers, Florida. And if you're thinking, isn't that the place that just got hit by a hurricane? Yes, we are the place that just got hit by a hurricane. Um, we are a fairly young institution. We're the 10th uh, public university in the state university system. We were approved by the legislature in 1981. And just this August, we celebrated our 25th anniversary of classes. We have just about 16,000 students, about 87% of those are undergrads, a little over a third are first generation students, just to give you kind of an idea of who we are and where we're coming from. And a little bit about our department. So um, the University Archives Special Collections is actually a little bit younger than FGCU. Uh, we came about about 13 years ago with our first exhibition. Um, so in the initial years, we really focused more on creating diverse collections that represent our community and our students, as well as building relationships with community organizations um, and donors as well. Uh, and so now we're putting more of a focus on students, um, which is what our presentation is about. So the University Archives is the official repository for um, FGCU's documentation and history. And then the special collections puts more of a focus on the environmental and uh, cultural history of Southwest Florida. Uh, there were a lot of mom and pop shops kind of around in uh, historical societies. So uh, it, we, it was a really great opportunity for our department to kind of come in and help some of those uh, shops and uh, help collaborate with uh, historical societies. So before we can even really talk about how our, we're going to get to our project, we promise. <laughs> um, it, we developed this project that I'll keep referring to, we're going to just explain, um, in a program called Integrating Sustainability Across the Curriculum. One of a really key parts of Florida Gulf Coast University is sustainability in the environment and sustainability education. It's one of those core concepts that our institution was founded on. And so the provost approved a program that helps faculty and staff develop uh, assignments and curriculum and co-curricular activities that to better embed sustainability and environmental education within the curriculum across disciplines. And so this past spring, Bailey and I participated in that program. We learned even more about the environment and sustainability and found a good way to incorporate archives into this broader program uh, throughout the university. And so even more background, um, we have a class um, that is very unique to our university. It's called University Colloquium, as you can see here. 
Um, and every undergraduate student that comes through Florida Gulf Coast University has to take this class. It is a requirement to graduate. Um, and so the mission of the course is to empower students to take to act for social, environmental, and economic sustainability in a changing world. So it kind of introduces students to the complexities of sustainability within our society and how they can use that in their everyday lives. Uh, faculty members from every sort of college across campus teaches it, as well as community members coming in to teach students as well. So it's this really interesting mix of um, you know, faculty members with PhDs versus uh, community members who just really know the area and know the environment of the area. Um, and in the course, students are taken on field trips. Uh, you would think students would be super excited to take field trips, but they in fact are not because it is on a different day than what the actual class is. But uh, it's just to kind of give examples and to show sustainability in our community um, and how it's been and how it works every day. Um, and so the people who created FGC wanted to ensure that there was an opportunity for students to engage with their community and to uh, make sure that we are practicing sustainability um, after college. Also, the picture you saw that was actually from a field trip. So uh, there were some cool field trips that students could take. I'll mess this up by trying to go back. You're good. <laughs> uh, and so I just wanted to kind of point out um, the course objectives that you see up here. So, objective one identify ecological relationships using Southwest Florida in your own community as a living laboratory. Objective two analyze sustainability concepts and interactions from an ecological, economic, and social perspective. Connect uh, principles of sustainability to your academic major, profession, and lifestyle choices. And finally, um, reflect on your sense of place within the context of local, national, and global issues. And it was really important for us to kind of look at the learning objectives because we wanted to be able to make our project, our activity, kind of mold around those while also introducing students to primary sources. Which brings me to our personal goals going into uh, ISAC. So we wanted to introduce more students to UASC, uh, encourage primary source research across disciplines, and increase access and use of UASC materials. As I mentioned, we're still a young department. Uh, we, we have focused on um, instructing students in the past. We've had classes come in, but really now is the time. It's a good time for us to be able to kind of uh, focus more on our students and getting them to use primary resources. So the project. Um, as Bailey mentioned, going into ISAC, we knew we wanted obviously to incorporate sustainability and environmental education with primary sources and uh, the university archive. And But being in the academy gave us an opportunity to really sit down with teaching faculty who were directly working with these students and to really get their feedback and ask them questions um, in a way where they were already sort of in the mindset of like, this is the goal and this is the purpose. And so ultimately we came up with a flexible asynchronous activity that was specifically designed for university colloquium students that used primary sources in order to help students to understand their local environment by identifying the ecological, economic, and social relationships of the university and the surrounding community. So this is reflecting some of those key goals from University Colloquia and also getting to introduce primary source material to a lot of times students that maybe would never have even heard of the archive by the time they graduated. Because as we said, University Colloquia is something that all students take, not just like your humanities and your social science students. And so we are going to briefly like through the project, just so as we continue on in this presentation, you have a good understanding kind of, of what we're saying and what we're talking about. We'll show different pieces of it in more detail, but just to give you a quick overview of what we're even talking about. I'm gonna sit so I don't mess, so I can click properly. So it's about, there's two pieces of it. And so this is just one half of it. It's about a 45 minute, uh, 30 to 45 minutes, kind of depending on your student and how focused they are. Having students go in, we're collecting some demographic information. Um, 
As we mentioned, these are students who may have no prior experience with the archive, so we wanted to make sure we included an introduction to the archive, as well as an understanding of what a primary versus a secondary source is. Um, then we're diving in to the actual activity, um, just going through both of the different versions of the two versions are anywhere from about 18 to 20 ish slides. And so if you were a student doing this, you would, of course, be scrolling through uh, and looking at the different documents. Um, but this is, like, as I said, just to give you a brief overview. and a chance to show off how pretty our campus is. <laughs> yeah, just to give you as I said, um, a better understanding of what all we're talking about. So these were the learning objectives that, or the lesson objectives that we created. So students will learn how to access the archives to request primary resources and how to access digital FGCU, which is our digital repository. It is globally accessible. So if any of you are interested, please come up and talk to us. We love talking about digital FGCU. <laughs> Um, objective two, uh, students will be able to distinguish primary from secondary sources. Objective three, students will use primary resources to understand the basic principles of sustainability. And finally, students will learn to think critically about current sustainability practices in their community. Uh, so, of course, we ran into problems. <laughs> Shocking, I can, I know. Um, and some of the biggest questions and challenges that we had to address was what collections would we use? What materials from those collections would we want to select? What system would we use to, you know, create, have this lesson in? How would we design the lesson? And how do we deliver the lesson to professors? And how do we get them to use it? And so we're going to kind of go through some of those challenges that we had and that we came across. So we wanted to do something from the spec side and also from uh, the university archive side. And so from the specs perspective, uh, we have the Kevin Irwin Environmental Ecology Collection. I didn't mention this before, but um, our archive has about 720 linear feet of materials. 300 feet of that is um, committed to environmental studies. And so uh, the Kevin Irwin Environmental Ecology Collection is actually one of our largest. Uh, and so a little bit about Kevin Irwin, he is a world-renowned ecologist. Um, he's worked on many projects over the years, um, including helping find the land for uh, FGCU. And so in 2018, he retired, retired, uh, if you ask his wife, different story. Um, he, I'm sure he's actually going to be pretty busy uh, in the coming months having to do with Hurricane Ian. Um, but luckily, he did uh, donate his life's work to our archives. So we're very lucky to be able to have those projects, um, especially having to do with uh, the history of choosing the land for Florida Gulf Coast University. From University Archives, we use the University Site Selection Collection, um, which looks at the, has the documentation and the materials from choosing the site of FGCU. So prior to its existence, um, or the approval of the legislature in 1991, there was nothing on the site where it currently sits, except trees, mangroves, and swamp, right? So we had to build this, uh, it's uh, an entire community, really, because it's both the university and the surrounding area. And so one of the great things about having these two collections is it's not often that it kind of feels like our collections are having a conversation. You have the perspective of the ecologist and who has his own set of priorities and uh, things to consider. And then you have the perspective of the State of Florida Board of Trustees and the university president. 
who have their own set of goals and priorities. So it was really great. And that's why we wanted to make sure that we paired these two together. So material selection, uh, my personal favorite. I feel like I don't get to actually look at the collections as a researcher per se, because we help kind of process. And so uh, it was really fun for us to be able to kind of pick our materials. So the first material that we use, as you saw in the activity, um, are maps. And so we chose maps because we felt like students are not as exposed to maps. They have GPS where it kind of just tells them where to go. And so this was a really great opportunity to introduce um, maps. Also, they're big, they're awkward. So in, during instruction sessions, when students come in, it's kind of hard to pick them out. And so it was just a really great opportunity. Um, and then it also allows students to show their sense of place, which as we mentioned, that is part of the colloquium, knowing where you are at within society, both physically, emotionally, all that stuff. Um, and then also STEM professors were really interested in this type of um, uh, material and showing students. So it's a really great opportunity uh, for STEM professors to see the maps and also help the students read the maps. A, another resource that we definitely wanted to include was letters. Letters are sort of the, the quintessential primary source. Um, they're also just really fun and lovely, if you ask me. Um, but they're also something that students, again, don't have as much experience or uh, they're not used as often anymore. And so we wanted to use this as an opportunity to just sort of refresh or remember our um, primary source materials um, on like the basic skills of how to use a letter and looking at who is the sender, why are they sending it, sort of what those purposes and goals are. And then also get students to think critically about questions related to the United Nations sustainability develop, Sustainable Development Goals, which is something that is pretty heavily used throughout the university colloquium courses. And our next were legal and professional reports. Um, so like letters, documents are very much standard, common um, as primary sources. Um, we wanted um, to have a selection criteria document and then also um, a legislative document. And so part of this is for students who might see these documents as kind of daunting, is for them to be able to pull out the information that they need. So kind of the information literacy part of it. Um, because even I remember as a student seeing these documents, it's like, I'm not reading that, there's no <laughs> way. Um, and so um, again, really awesome opportunity for uh, students to learn some information literacy, being able to pull out the important parts and kind of bypassing the other parts. And we also include oral histories, which again are something that students outside of the humanities and social sciences don't get to use quite as often and are also really great and important parts of our collection. And so we have um, an oral history both from the Kevin Irwin collection as well as university archives. The one that's seen on the screen is from our first university president, Dr. Roy McTarnigan. And so he talks about you know, sort of the creation and selection of the university. And so this is again, asking students to become familiar with something that they're perhaps not as exposed to, and also getting them to think critically on the creation of history, right? So who's asking the questions? How did they come up with those questions? Why are they asking those questions? And sort of like uh, the making of memory as you're getting to hear uh, Roy McTarnigan tell the story like 10 years after the fact. Uh, and so getting them to think about history in that way is also one of our goals from using these materials. So how are we going to get the lesson to the professors? Um, in the ISAC Academy, we had lots of conversations with faculty members and we heard lots of various uh, responses. Um, so some wanted just an asynchronous lesson where they could just give it to their students to take home and do. And they could you know, talk about it in class, but more of like just like a busy work kind of assignment. Some professors wanted to actually bring their students into the archive and for us to take materials out and to go through uh, a whole activity with them. Um, and then some wanted us to be able to put it into Canvas, which is the learning management system that we use. Uh, and so 
the way that we were able to kind of meet in the middle with all of that was creating the asynchronous lesson that we showed earlier. And professors will still have the opportunity to bring in their classes if they want, um, but also there's that flexibility of being able to say, you guys can go do this at home um, and not to you know, worry about having to take time out of their already very busy and packed schedules uh, for their course. So one of the really big challenges that we had is we had this really clear picture of what we wanted in this lesson. We had our materials selected, we have chosen our collection, we talked to faculty. Now, how do we make it? <laughs> um, and so we went through a couple of different iterations and our first thought was, let's do it in Google Form. Everybody loves Google Forms, they're pretty easy to use. People are familiar with them. Um, unfortunately for us, our script's not institutionally supported. And so since this is something that we wanted to push out to campus, it was really important that we use something that would that was supported by the institution and would keep us um, out of the wrath of ITS. So that led us to Microsoft. So we're a Microsoft institution. So we looked to Microsoft Forms, which if anyone's tried to use Microsoft Forms, is not my favorite product. Um, one of the really big problems that we had with that is that we couldn't include media easily within Microsoft Forms. And so we moved along. But it really was uh, very great, very wonderful that uh, at this time, our institution purchased Live, App, Live Wizard tutorials. And so ultimately, we found that that was going to be the system that was most likely to do everything that we had envisioned and that we wanted to do for this assignment. And so we ultimately decided to use um, LibWizard tutorials. And so for the activity, um, the lesson design, initially when we were choosing our collections, we wanted to show different perspectives um, and kind of to have students think critically about the perspectives that they're going to be reading about. You know, this is a really um, wonderful, um, opportunity for students to think about bias, think about the roles involved in the creation of FGCU. There's a lot of more mysticism around FGCU and how it was created. And so uh, we thought that by doing this activity with the two different collections and trying to put it into one activity that they would be able to kind of distinguish between the two. And so unfortunately, in the end, we ended up having to do it in two separate activities. And so students will have um, the opportunity to be able to choose between which collection they want. So they could do the university site selection or they could do the uh, Kevin Irwin environmental ecology collection. And make, we hope that possibly the professors will have students kind of discuss their different takes of the quiz. Again, we're kind of just leaving that up to the professors and um, how much time they have in their classes. Um, but the way that we ended up designing it, um, it ended up being really flexible for professors. And we found that by being more flexible, there's more buy-in. <laughs> so. so one thing we wanted to make sure that we discussed was if someone wanted to replicate this and do this in their own institution, how could that happen? So of course you could do it exactly how we did it and use the wizard tutorials if that's something that your institution subscribes to, um, but not everyone does. It's kind of expensive and it just might not be the best fit. So before I even begin talking about different software applications, the first thing I would say is choose your system before you design the lesson. Um, as I mentioned before, that was like one of the things that meant that we couldn't use or didn't want to use different um, programs. But if you have an idea of what system you're using and what that system can do, it can help direct how you put your lesson together. But ultimately, two of the ways that we kind of landed on prior to going to Live Apps was Microsoft Sway. So as I mentioned before, you can include media really in Microsoft Forms, but you can embed Microsoft Forms into Microsoft Sway, which does allow for media. Um, it's pretty nice. It's you can, can basically create kind of like a standalone site in it. It's one page. You kind of scroll through it. The only um, not great thing about it is the form doesn't necessarily scroll at the same pace as your user does. 
it's nothing prohibitive uh, and our testers i just warned them said hey you might have to scroll a little bit or you might have to refresh your page and scroll back down and once they were pre-warned it was pretty simple to use um, you can also put this directly into canvas uh, we wanted to make sure that we could share this broadly, even if it's like a co-curricular or to students within the archive. But if your main focus is getting faculty to just import it straight from Canvas Commons into their Canvas shell, doing it, building it directly into Canvas is a really great option. You can do the quizzes, you can add professor notes that they can delete afterwards on a page, you can include your media, and then they can also use that directly to pull their grades from if that's something that they're looking for. So those are two really great options. Um, other things that we didn't go as in depth with, but that might go, be good options for you would be, again, Google Forms. It's not institutionally supported for us, but it may be institutionally supported for others. If you're in Adobe Campus, I'm quite confident that Adobe Express could do something really similar. We also looked at using um, Soft Chalk as well. It was recommended by a faculty member to us. And then if you've got the skills and the know-how, you could just build your own site, um, which I envy you if you can do that, but um, that would give you the most freedom and creativity, of course. And here are some links and bibliographies to some articles that we used. We're happy to share this with anyone and we'll make it available to SGA as well. Um, but we'd like to open the floor to, oh, before I say that, I'm sorry. If you would like to take the quiz, <laughs> you're welcome to. This will take you to the Kevin Irwin side. Um, so you do not have all the answers from when we were scrolling through it. Um, do not feel obligated to do this, but if it's something you're interested in, uh, you can go ahead and do that as we move on to. And please questions. feel free to use the quiz as, you know, for your own work. I hope you guys got it. I don't know how to go back. Yeah. Are there any questions? Yes. So we reached out to faculty prior to the fall semester. We got about five-ish people to agree to it. I expect that the actual number of users is going to drop this semester. We lost about two weeks of classes during the hurricane. And in truncating the semester, I am guessing this is one of the activities that's going to have to get cut. So five, um, in practice, it may be fewer. Almost all of those were university colloquium courses. We did have one faculty member or adjunct from um, composition one who wanted to use it. And I said, sure. <laughs> so I'm interested to get their feedback if they actually get to use it to see if this is something that could apply outside of kind of the purpose it was created for. And Thank those, you. Um, those libraries and students that they still have people have access to It does actually. So that was one of the things we really liked about it. It has very good reporting statistics. So we can send those to faculty, we can export it. There's a spot where we have students include their faculty member's name. Or if they don't care, we have it for our students. Um, it's, it's not really a question, it's just a comment. Uh, we have uh, a little bit of that at my campus group. So it's fascinating, but I had never considered using it in the way that you guys are using it here. And so I just wanted to make the comment that that is <laughs> what an amazing thing preparation to see that happen because it's like it's a great platform, but there's still so many ways that you could use it. Thank you. We were also the first, so <laughs> everyone was like, you're our guinea pigs. <laughs> yeah. This is brilliant because more and more instruction is being delivered online. And yet the archive instruction is still a lot tied to these archives, you know, come in. And do things. So this is beyond being, you know, I've done it for an online class. I thought that this is really, really great. Thank you. <laughs> this is the future. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. We figured too, it was kind of nice because um, we're digitizing constantly, right? And so it's just like a nice 
way for us to kind of do double the work, like two, kill, uh, two birds, one stone. Um, and so a lot of the things that you saw here, we actually hadn't digitized yet. And so we were able to kind of be, give up to our interns for them to digitize and then we can add it to our digital repository while also making a quiz. Yeah. I actually did have a question about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so and I, you, I think you've alluded to it, but I, I may have missed it. So to um, this, this asynchronous component, like how long would it take a student uh, ideally to complete this exercise that I think you guys have been doing? Yeah, we um, used our interns to test them and time them. <laughs> and mind you, these are students who are familiar with archives and primary sources, and it took them like, 25 to 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I don't really believe they watched the whole 10 minute introduction to archives video. Um, so our, our estimate for a student who's less familiar and actually watches the entirety of the video is at about 45 minutes. Okay, great. And that's something else we talked with faculty members too about was how long do they want the lessons. So the colloquium classes are about an hour and 15 minutes. Um, that's the across the board. Um, and so they really wanted something, if they were doing it in class, they wanted something that they could do within that class period. And so that was kind of our basis. Are these face to face classes or an online or online classes or a mix? The, yeah. They're a mix. Um, so some uh, classes are offered virtually, some are offered um, in person. Um, since the pandemic, there has been a lot more virtual classes. I don't think they're doing as many in person. Um, I actually am an alumni from FGCU. I took colloquium and I really enjoyed it. I think that being in person, it was a really um, awesome experience being able to work with, you know, talk with community members and then work with students that were outside of my major. That's also another really awesome thing about the class is that you're in a mix of students that you've never seen before. And so, you you know, I was an anthropology major and then I was with somebody who was biological uh, or a bio major. So, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a really great mix of a class. And what level of students, uh, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? Uh, they want it, they gear it towards sophomores and juniors. Um, and seniors, they don't really want freshmen taking it. Um, and since it is a class that is required for everybody to fill up really quickly, so usually it's about junior to uh, senior students. Yeah, but there's the potential you could get a freshman in there. Mm -hmm. um, I would be impressed if they got, if they yeah. made it in because, like Bailey said, they fill up really fast. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, in, I want to say it's maybe the second or third page, there's a block where, first of all, faculty are supposed to tell us when they are going to put it in their course. Um, and then if it gives an option for like asking students, who's your instructor? And if they select that, then it's really easy to filter the results by instructor name. Um, and then right now it's a really, it's a small body of people. So it's even if someone skips that or misses that question, it's easy to figure it out. Um, I think if we ever expanded it right to every colloquium course, which is, you know, that's the goal, uh, we would probably have to make copies. But for right now, it's that asking students to self input who their professor is. Um, and what course they're in. And then this faculty can opt in. They can get like the submission results sent to them as well. Um, the only option for that is every single submission result, or I can export the data when their students are done. And so uh, I'll have to see which one they prefer afterwards. in that quiz, but they can't proceed any further until they actually select. That's a good point. And, and that way you're not tied to, I've got to create like X number of copies of this. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a really Thank good you. point. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Right. Thank you.
So H12 to me reacts as like if, if you're asking kind of like value for this question about what did you find the most marketed, have you really used that question to tweak anything or done a question? I don't think we're quite at that stage yet. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, like Vic mentioned, um, a lot of time was lost from the uh, hurricane. They've actually instated Saturday classes to make up for that time. Um, that's been a really big controversy. <laughs> um, and so, um, so yeah, we haven't been able to really, we've only really gotten feedback from a few professors and then our interns. So. But that is one of the goals of having that question in there is that when we have, you know, a significant body of data that we can sort of look to that to get a better understanding. So when you say expanding campus, does that mean something like, I don't know what the other one will get, does that mean the same format but different collections you get to pull from? Is that what that means by expanding? Yeah, so there we go. <laughs> um, it's kind of two part. One, there's a lot of sections of university colloquium. So expanding in the sense more sections, but also expanding in the sense different courses. So I think in my you know, own personal vision, one thing I'd like to see is if it goes well in this comp one course, then is that something that we can build out maybe using different collections to use for uh, like composition one, that first day that required English one course for students. I could also see it being used in uh, we have a civic literacy requirement in Florida. I don't know if it's the same here, but students have to take either um, intro to American history up to 1877 or post reconstruction or political science. So I could see using it there um, and trying to embed it in these courses where students are going to have to take it at some point. And wouldn't it be great for them to get this introduction to archives um, so that it kind of hits across the board with students, even, you know, students in our water school who want nothing to do with us. <laughs> so that's, that's my goal. If anyone is interested in replicating what we did, we're more than happy to send you our notes and documentation and walk and help you through it. Um, our contact information is up here. If you'd like to do it, but you don't have LibWizard, um, we did a lot of testing in those different systems. And so again, we're more than happy to share our information and knowledge and help however we can. Thank you. Thank you.